Welcome to the video lecture series, Culture, Worldview, and Origins. <clears throat> We're Tim and Holly Nyquist. This is part four of the origin of life from a non-Western biblical parameter. Uh, you might be thinking, well, you said biblical, but we don't have any Bible yet. Well, this is what we're getting into now. We're getting into the biblical side of the origin of life. How is the origin of life to be understood biblically from the Hebrew culture? Um, that meant uh, Hebrew culture, non-Western. So let's, let's get right into it. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. We're talking about the origin of life. How did it begin? Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. So this is the beginning of life on the earth, or actually probably in the whole universe. Um, God said, it was God's command, God's word. It was God willing. So in other words, it was his idea and his will, and it was created. God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. Does the earth have within its own potential to produce life on and of itself? And the closed system model would say yes, that that's how, we, that's how all life got here. The, the slime, the water, the mud, the plants, you know, with the heat. Uh, from the sun. The creation model is not too much different from that for somebody that just covers their ears and stands there and looks at the process. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation. And what happened? The earth sprouted vegetation. That's what happened. So does the earth have the power of life to produce life? I would say no, the earth in and of itself does not, but because of the command of God, it did. And so in other words, the life of God was transmitted by command, verbal command, to the planet earth. Okay, Genesis 1.20, then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. Okay, in the evolutionary framework, life they envision begins in the water. And I think God, to complicate things, just started with the dirt, with the earth, and said, let the earth produce. And then the second form of life, or the second day of producing life, the God said, let the waters team. So in other words, then the waters produce life. Can the waters produce life in and of themselves? And the answer would be no. Um, it's only through an obedience to the direct command of God. The God that commands enables. And so that is why um, I, I, I believe there's confusion and, and some people worship the uh, planet Earth. They worship the waters. They worship different objects thinking that they produce the life when actually they in obedience were used to produce life, but it wasn't them that produced it. They were the channel for it. Genesis 1.24, then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. In each one of these creation of, of life contexts, it was God commanded and it was so, and each one was created after their kind. In other words, it was block, block creation. Each one was created after its kind, and it was created already producing mature fruit, product, seeds, and fruit. So in other words, it was not a Western linear one line going up um, evolutionary framework. It was multiple lines, multiple blocks of creation of life. So that is, that is what the biblical record teaches us. Genesis 1.26, then God said, okay, what we have here is a, a, a diversion, or not diversion, but a different process of creation. In the first part of creation, God commanded, God commanded, 
and God commanded, and it was so. And it was kind of like Leonardo da Vinci and his picture of, of, of God creating. It's God is, is holy, and matter in their mind is, is profane, and so God cannot touch matter. And, and so that it's a divine spark that jumps between the finger of God and into and, and matter. But in the, the biblical model, it's, it's not that way. Sure, God commanded in the first one, and it happened. The second one, it happened. God commanded again. But in this one, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, over all the, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Genesis 2, 7. Then God, the Lord God, formed man of the dust, of dust from the ground. It was a direct hands-on process. So it, it is not the divine spark without God touching. And it was not profane. The, the physical world was not something that the holiness could not touch. The, the holiness created it perfect in a perfect world. And therefore, God takes what he had created perfect and, and molded and shaped a man in his own image. It was direct hands-on. It wasn't just a divine spark uh, from a, a safe distance. It was, uh, was hands-on. So what about the human body? The human body was formed from the dust of the ground. And that's, that's the biblical record. Um, how close does that record come to being true? Well, we have knowledge of today is that the human body is composed of what? Of 65% more or less water. The body is composed of more or less 65% water. 14% fat. So fat is our body is 65% water, 14% fat. Proteins, about 14% proteins. Minerals, about 6%. And then carbohydrates, about 1%. Okay, so that is more or less of what the human body is composed of, which are all common elements that are, are found in the Earth's crust. Well, elements, talking about elements, let's get down to the elements. Uh, there are six basic elements that compose 99% of the, of the body mass. Oxygen, 65% of the body mass is, is oxygen. Carbon, 18% of the body mass is carbon. Hydrogen, 10%. Phosphorus, 1%. Sulfur, 0.2 to 0.4%. And sodium, 0.1 to 0.2%. Of the body mass. What's interesting then is that these elements are commonly found within the earth crust, within the, 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 the earth's um, mantle. Uh, but one other things that are, are, are fascinating to know is that why were these chosen? Why were these elements chosen to be the basic building blocks of the human body? It's kind of like, well, what do you mean? Well, um, the earth has silicon in it, but yet our bodies only carry trace amounts of silicon, and not silicone. Uh, silicone is a mixture of, of ingredients to make a rubbery product. Silicon is the second most abundant element in the earth's crust following oxygen. Okay, it composes about 28% of the Earth's mass, but yet how much of that 28% of the Earth's mass is in the human body? It's only trace amounts. And it's kind of like, well, why, why did God do that? Why, why don't we have more silicon in us? Um, I don't know. But what that means is that our bodies were specially um, built or made out of certain minerals. And um, it was not based on the availability of minerals or the popularity or the highest concentration of minerals. It was a, a body put together by a master builder that used what he wanted to use and not just what was most available. 
So in other words, we have only trace amounts of silicone in us. Now silicone is useful in our bodies um, for ligaments or attachments and, and, and knee and joints. It's, it's, it's useful um, and it, it's there, but it's very small amounts compared to the rest of the body and compared to its presence within the Earth's crust. Number two is aluminum is the third most common element in the Earth's crust, making up about 8% of the Earth's mass. And yet aluminum, again, is not really found in the human body and they are doing studies now of saying uh, the use of aluminum in um, injections or, or in, in just surrounding our body in it or with it uh, may not be um, healthy. Um, they don't know that. There's no direct conclusions on that yet, but they're, they're looking at aluminum as, as being the causes of, of some of the uh, possibly Alzheimer, Alzheimer's. They've, they've seen that Alzheimer patients uh, generally have an elevated uh, level of aluminum within their, uh, their, their brain structure. So it's kind of like, I, I don't know what the thing is, of what the conclusion is. There is no conclusion, it's just the beginning studies, but that our bodies are not made of, not made up of the most common elements. Our bodies are made up of elements that are found, but not in the highest percentages of the Earth's crust. Genesis 319, by the sweat of your face, you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you are taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This is the curse, Genesis 3.19, and saying that after the sin, you were taken from the ground, you're going to return to the ground, because you are, you are dust. And that's pretty much what we are chemically, is dust. Psalm 103.14, For he himself knows our frame. He is mindful that we are but dust. Ecclesiastes 3, 19 through 20. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath, and there is no advantage for man over beast, for all is vanity. All go to the same place. All came from the dust, and all return to the dust. This is Ecclesiastes 3, 19 through 20, which if one was a materialist and said that there is no spiritual dimension to man, that man does not have a soul, that man is just a product of, 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 of chemicals, then this would be true. Vanity of vanities. There is no difference between man or beast. As a beast dies, so man dies. So beast returns to the dust, so man returns to the dust. So what is the advantage? If you're just looking at it as, as chemical composition, there would be no advantage because they both return to the dust. But does man possess something else? Does life, is life something else? Is life more than the chemical compounds? Is life something that we possess and that our chemical compounds maintain? The chemical elements or the, the, the body is, is kind of like a, a recipient, a receptacle for the life? Or did that produce life? And that would be the question that would be answered by your basic belief system. And my basic belief system is that life comes from God. And that's what we're going to see in the next series, this next lecture, is that what is the biblical origin of life? We've seen life that God did it, but how did he do it? Or what is the difference between life between man and beast? And that's what we're going to be looking at in the further studies. Thanks again for joining me. Again, we're Tim and Holly Nyquist, and you're welcome to communicate to us at the addresses that are shown. Thanks again.